Haiku. And uh, you, if you have your notes before you, um, well, actually, we're going to be starting out a little bit before that. We're going to cover some of the verses that uh, we covered last week. But I also will be covering to the end of chapter two as well. So um, before we start uh, reading, let's uh, bow for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and for your mercy, for the word that you have given to us. And we pray that you would just uh, bless your word and bless the hearers, Lord, today. And we pray that as we hear what you have to say to us, Lord, that we would take this and file it deep away into our hearts so that we will not forget the lesson that we are learning today. Lord, we pray that we would also make it realize that we can practically live this out in every day of our life with the, with the new knowledge and understanding that you have given to us from your word. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. The passage that we're going to be looking at today um, covers essentially from verse 13 to verse 23, but we're going to be focusing on verse 19 to 23, but I'll be reading um, from verse 13 to 23. Now when they had gone, that would be the Magi, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity. From two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi, then what had been spoken to the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So far, the reading of God's wonderful and holy word. One of the things we learn as we are going through the book of Matthew, Matthew makes so much reference to the Old Testament. We covered this the last time. He refers to the Old Testament more than the other gospels combined. One of the things is when we look at the Old Testament, and we see the history of Israel especially, we have to ask ourselves, did Israel succeed as being God's people, as being a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, as God expressed in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. He said, you are to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. But I think we could all uniformly agree that they were an abysmal failure at this. Because at the very time that they were given the law, what were they doing? They were creating an idol to be worshipped. And there was just so many things. We even see them before they even get out of, of the complete grasp of Egypt. They get to the Red Sea and they start saying, what did you bring us out here to, uh, to in the desert to die by the hand of the Egyptian army? They, again, and they worship the false god at Sinai. They um, feared the giants when they went into the land of Israel and then we ended up staying out of the land of Israel for 40 years before God allowed them to come back in. They've disobeyed God and his commands 
and they worshiped false gods. They allowed God's temple to be profaned. So the list goes on and on with so many things that Israel did that where they failed as a kingdom of priests, as God's holy people. And they were punished for this behavior. They were sent into exile. They were not a holy nation. They were not a kingdom of priests as they should have been. Yet, as we see and we look back at Abraham, God made a promise to Abraham. And what was that promise? That his seed, his family would be a blessing to the whole world. And we think and we see what Israel is doing and we think of God's promise that he made and we go, how is this going to happen? <clears throat> and Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 gives us the key. It gives us that helps us to understand and gives us the ability to see how this will take place. Because Galatians chapter 3 verse uh, 16 says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed. That is Christ. That's Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. So, what Paul is saying there is that Jesus is the true, the ideal, the faithful Israel. That's what Paul is saying. And Matthew, he wants us to see that as well. And so today, we are going to be seeing that Jesus is that true, ideal, and faithful Israel in his identification with the Exodus. We're going to see that he is the true ideal and that faithful Israel in the restoration from exile or the return to Israel. And we also will see that Jesus is that true ideal and faithful Israel in his humiliation that he endures for his enemies. So we begin today's passage at verse 19, but I want us to again to go quickly and go over a summary <clears throat> starting at verse 13 and see how Matthew wants us to see that Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel and that he is really that typification of what Jesus truly and fully is. So he, and Matthew wants us to see the hints and the shadows and the smoke that Matthew is creating so that we will see what will be eventually be fanned into full flame in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he experiences his exodus, his restoration from exile, returning to the land of Israel, his humiliation for his enemies. So if we look back at chapter 2, verse 13 of Matthew, and we go through this passage, we can see a parallel between Jesus and Israel. And there are some things in here that as, they, as you read these, this passage, you're going to see, I see what Matthew is doing. It's not, some of this is not direct quoting reference, but some of this is allusion to the Old Testament. And one of the things that we see is in verse 13, it says, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. One of the interesting things is, is there's another point here in this story where God appears to Joseph in a dream. The interesting part is, is when we think about another Joseph who was a dreamer as well. And we see a parallel in this picture that we see here as he precedes them. But then we also see where does he take the child? He, they take the child into Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. A parallel that we see with Israel, Jacob and his sons go to Egypt for protection and survival. And we see that in Genesis. 
we see that Israel fled Egypt in the middle of the night after the Passover and the angel of death because Herod persecuted in a way that was very similar to Pharaoh because what did he do? He killed all the male infants of Bethlehem in the same way that Pharaoh would kill all the male infants in Egypt. And this was in the middle of the night that this took place. And how did Egypt come out? How did Israel come out of Egypt in the middle of the night after that Passover meal? And then we also see <clears throat> Jesus undergoing this exodus. Another thing that we see that is similar in this exodus is this that when Joseph comes out of Egypt and he comes into the land of Israel, what happens? He hears of Archelaus, and what does he do? Fear comes in his heart, and he hesitates to come back into the land of Israel had it not been for another uh, dream from, from God. And so in a way, we also see that typified when Israel comes into the land of Israel, and they hear this great report about the land of spies, the, the, when the spies went into the land and they come back and they fear. And in each one of these things we see Israel, they complain, they fail, and all these things. Where Jesus, when we see this, he succeeds in each one of these steps. So Jesus is undergoing an exodus and an entrance into Israel. He's experiencing this. And Matthew is saying here, all this is a picture of Christ. What we see even when we quote um, the, the words of Moses from, from Exodus chapter 4, verse 23, when he says, let my people go. But what are his exact words in Exodus 4, 23? Let my son go, which is really an interesting thing to think about. Let my son go. Let my people go. That is what Moses is saying at that time. <clears throat> so what's the practical aspect of this? What's, what's the practical thing that we can take about from this? This exodus and this journey, and not only this, but his life growing up, his, his ministry, is often referred to in the Christian world as the active obedience of Christ. We often refer to him going to the cross and him dying for our sins at the cross, the passive obedience of Christ. But his life, as we see, is his active obedience of Christ. And that's an important thing for us to think about. Because as we see the journey that Jesus took, <clears throat> what he did, he did in perfection what Israel could not do. They failed. And in the same way, we fail in so many ways as well. And when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't just receive the benefits of his death and burial. We receive the benefits of his perfect life. Because when we receive Christ, we receive his perfectness. We receive his perfection. And he takes all of our imperfection. Jesus has covered our sins and our iniquities because of his life of obedience. In a way, it's like as we're walking down the beach and we go off the path where we shouldn't be going, it's as if Jesus is coming along, sweeping our steps and him taking those steps and where we should have gone, where we should have been. He, through his life, he is erasing our mistakes because we have his righteousness seen in us because we are in Christ and in him. Jesus traveled and took the steps that we should have. And, and that's the first part of this that we see where Jesus is that true and ideal Israel. And that's important that he is because he is that perfect high priest. And, and one of the interesting things is as we read this thing, we get to the passage that we're looking at today, and we're going to see in, in the first few verses, this, this second exodus that Jesus is the true, ideal, faithful Israel because he experiences this exodus 
out of Egypt coming back to Israel. And he says, but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go into the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. And again, we see here Joseph obeying and what he, what, what he heard in the dream, what God told him in the dream, what he saw there. And we see Joseph's obedience to God's command. It was obedient. It was an immediate obedience that he had. And again, what takes place here is we see Joseph, this dreaming Joseph, and in so many different ways we see this as he is taking the lead and taking the, his family out of Egypt and into Israel. And then we see this fear that takes place because says, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And then it says, being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee. And I can almost hear the Lord as he's speaking to him in this dream, almost saying, don't be like the Israelites and stay back. This is, I mean, when we hear this word warn, it's not just a simple, okay, I've got a different plan for you. Sneak around the edge of the coast and go over here to Nazareth. He's telling him, don't go back to Egypt. Go forward. He says, I'm the God who has kept you this whole time. I have a plan. Don't fall back like the Israelites did. And there's a parallel that I think that Matthew wants us to see here between Israel and Jesus. So Joseph, he, he enters the land and there's this overwhelming fear in the same way that the Israelites had this overwhelming fear. So, and so here we have Joseph as he is returning into the land of Israel and he is being warned by God in this dream. And he left again for the regions of Galilee. And I think this was, wasn't just a warning just to say you need to not go back to Egypt, but you also need to head to Nazareth because there's going to be something that takes place here. See, he's warned, he's admonished, and he's given us revelation and this instruction. And like I said before, this was something that was parallels the life of, of, of Israel in the, in the kingdom of Israel. And then it says in verse 23, and he came and lived in the city of Nazareth. And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And when we look at this passage and we see this fulfillment of this one passage, we say, he shall be called a Nazarene. How many people know what passage from the Old Testament that he is quoting from here? I don't either, because it's not a quote from the Old Testament. <laughs> because that's the one thing that is kind of interesting about this. This is not a direct quote from the Old Testament. It's not a quote from the prophets. This is actually something that we could probably say that prophets spoke about. And what the other part is with this is, where did he talk about Nazareth in the Old Testament? You don't, because Nazareth didn't that exist in the time of the prophets. So there's two problems that we have in this. And, be, and a lot of the, the worldly people, they look at this passage and they say, see, this is all made up because this, isn't, this didn't really take place. And they use this because they say, here's an inconsistency in this passage. Well, what is Matthew saying here? What is he trying to tell us here? Well, like I said, um, first of all, one of the things you see is, it says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. There's plural. And so it's not taken from a particular, he didn't say this was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah or Isaiah. 
he says this in a plural. This was a common saying. So how is this common saying being said amongst the people of the prophets of Israel? In, in this is said to be fulfilled, spoken by the prophets. This may be looked at in, in, in a couple different ways. The first way is from in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Um, the word here being used in Isaiah is the word in Hebrew, Netzer, which is, signifies either a branch or the city of Nazareth. And, and, and so he is to be, be declared that branch. Jesus is to be declared that branch. The other point that is, can be said is this is as a name of reproach and contempt. And how, how is that this case here? In Nazareth, what we find is Nazareth is not your, uh, the best town to be around. It's not like a, a wonderful town like, a, like, say, Lake Oswego or a nice, beautiful town. And I had to scratch my head and think about what kind of town that we could think about from around here especially to say, what kind of town could you say that, you, is that this was, he was from? You could say, oh, he's from East L.A. or something like that. It sounds a pretty rough town, pretty bad neighborhood. But one thing that really clicked in my mind is, is uh, have, how many of you have heard of Wish Ramp? How many have been around Wish Ramp? Okay. I grew up part of my life in Wish Ramp. And even us, when we were there, we called it the armpit of the world. My brother often would call it the bottom of the toilet bowl. And so we didn't really like the town. It had a very bad reputation. There were no police in that town. There were lots of things that took place there that if you graduated from school there, they probably made you want to take high school all over again somewhere else if you went anywhere else. And so it would be like saying, well, he came from Wishram. He is a Wishramite. And so nothing good ever came out of Wishram. And so that is kind of the idea behind when it says, and he shall be called a Nazarene, a man from whom no good was to be expected and to whom no respect was to be paid. And it wasn't definitely not a Harvard man because a lot of Israelites probably wanted to see their Messiah come with a man of credentials and a man that was well respected. He came from Boston. He came from Harvard, a nice place. But yet this is what the prophecies spoke about. I mean, we see this. This was not particularly foretold by any one prophet, like I mentioned before, but in general, it was spoken by the prophets. Isaiah talks about this in Isaiah chapter 53, chapter two and chapter 53, verses two and three. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and in a way, when we read that, that's like saying cursed by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Psalm 22 speaks it is of him and where he says, but I am a worm and not of a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. This is Christ speaking here. Psalm 69, that he would be an alien to his brethren. Psalm 69 verses seven and eight, before, because <clears throat> for your sake, I have become a reproach. Dishonor has covered my face. I have become estranged to my brothers and an alien to my mother's sons. Paul the Apostle even speaks about this in Philippians chapter 2. 
he made himself of no reputation. Like I said, he is not a he didn't come with a good reputation or good credentials, but he took upon himself the form of a servant, not royalty, not a, not a learned Pharisee, but a despicable Nazarene. And that's what we find that was proclaimed by the prophets in general at that time. And that was fulfilled because he grew up in that town. And so <clears throat> what we see in this message today, we see that Christ has done, have, we have seen several things in here. We have seen that he, uh, he has that perfect and true Israel because he has experienced that exodus out of Egypt. We have seen that he is that true and perfect Christ as he, uh, uh, perfect Israel as he is entering Israel, as he is uh, coming out of exile. He is that true and perfect Israel as he is humiliated for his own enemies. Because that's who we were. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. And that is a beautiful thing. And if there's two things I want us to take away from today's message it is, first of all, when we see Joseph, when he has that fear of God, when we see that fear that he experiences, we, we, what do we see? We see God coming to him in, in a dream and telling him, go. And, and so what do we see with that? Joseph had that re report from the spies moment in his return to Israel. He comes into the land of Israel, coming out of Egypt. He comes across the border. He starts talking to the, to the other Israelites there. He learns and he sees that the King Herod's son is in charge, Archelaus, and fear grips his heart. But God appeared to him in a dream, warning to him. And instead of fearing man, and instead of fearing the leadership of that, of that country, in, in the same way that Israel, when they came, when they feared, he feared the one who would not just kill the body, but he feared the one who could kill both body and soul. And he took that fear to heart far greater because he was the same God that cared for them and brought them down into Egypt to be protected. He loved the one who brought them, who provided safety for them all along. So we can both love God and we can fear man. The creator and the sustainer of the heavens and earth is the one that we fear and love. God came to Joseph in a dream and God comes to us <clears throat> through his written word. And on a note on the whole subject of fear, it is a healthy thing to f understand that God is a terrifying God. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And to understand that, that when we are in God's hands, because we are his children, we can love him because he loves us. That is the beautiful part. And then the second thing I want us to at least understand and take away is the grace of God. After the fear of God, the grace of God, in the humiliation that he undertook, in the humiliation of Jesus, to know that God loves us so much that he sent us his son to be a vulnerable infant dependent upon humans be, to be carried by Mary and Joseph off into Egypt, <clears throat> born in a cattle feeding trough, raised in Nazareth, dying the death of a criminal, cursed by God for you and for me. That's God's grace. And again, what we see in that, he takes our curse and he gives us his righteousness. His perfect act of obedience was given to me. And he took that punishment that I severely deserve. And so all those who are in Christ are Israel. And we see this in 1 Peter 
chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And now also in Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 and 6, John is speaking to the seven churches that are in Asia. And he says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the rulers, uh, ruler of the kings of the earth to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Now, if we go back and we look and back in the beginning of our message, we went to Exodus chapter 16, verse 9, where what did he want Israel to be? A kingdom of priests. Here, this is what God is calling us, his people, a kingdom of priests. All of us who live by faith in Christ, who identify with Christ, are Israel. And that's even further um, brought forth to us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. That is probably one of the most amazing things for us to understand, that we are in Christ, we are in Israel, and we are, because of that, we are seen as righteous as that true and faithful Israel because of our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. So like I said, the two things I want us to take away is fearing God and understanding that the grace of God. Because without the grace of God, without the fear of God, how do we know really what the grace of God is about? So I think that's important for us to understand that we see in what Matthew is teaching us that Christ is that um, perfect Israel as he makes that exodus out of Egypt, as he enters back into Israel, and as he lives in Nazareth to be that perfect, that be that image of humiliation and dying the death of humiliation. And I think it's just an amazing thing that as we see these things, we begin to see by faith that we are experiencing these things, same things in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are in you, in Christ, a kingdom of priests, and one that cannot be taken away from us because of your obedience through your life and through everything that you have experienced in this world through your obedience in all things obeying the law in all ways and lord we thank you for sending your son jesus christ also to die on the cross for our sins to take our place and to give us a life that is perfect so that when you father look at us on judgment day what you see is perfection of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that in all that you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>